Today's webinar is about how to start a tool library in your community. Um, and we are going to um, be welcoming folks from all over the country. Over 200 people have registered for this webinar. And if you uh, click on the participants tab, you should be able to see the long list of people who are joining us today. We also have some folks coming in from other countries, um, some people from Europe, um, some from Asia um, and uh, South America, uh, maybe more. So welcome everyone. We're so excited that you can join us and it's really uh, exciting to see so many people interested in tool libraries. Yes, hello Canada. <laughs> so, um, all right. So let's get started. Um, I want to talk about uh, real briefly who the Center for a New American Dream is. So the, the Center for a New American Dream is a nonprofit based in the United States. And our mission statement is up on the screen. The Center for a New American Dream helps Americans to reduce and shift their consumption to improve quality of life, protect the environment, and promote social justice. Um, and so we really want to get Americans to change the American dream and focus it not on materialism and commercialism and shopping, um, because those things um, not only don't make us happy um, and they're not good for us or those around us, but also wrecks the environments around us, uh, but to really encourage folks to focus on things that really matter, which is community, family, relationships, things that really bring happiness and don't trash the planet at the same time. So we do this in three program areas, redefining the dream, which is changing what the American dream is about, beyond consumerism, which is giving folks tools to uh, avoid commercialism and shop conscious, uh, be conscious consumers. And lastly, the collaborative communities program, which this webinar is a part of. So the collaborative communities program is giving folks tools to take action in their communities to empower folks to start projects in their local uh, neighborhood. So um, one of the ways that folks can really help build their community is by sharing. And one of the best ways to share resources is through what's called a tool library. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with what a tool library is, but it's basically just like a library that you're used to. But instead of checking out books, you check out tools. Um, and there's a lot of different kinds of tool libraries, but they are almost always uh, at very low cost or free to borrowers. And they almost always serve the local community immediately uh, in that area. So tool libraries have many benefits. There's a lot of reasons why it's a good idea. Um, it just makes sense, right? Um, the average power tool the average power drill, sorry, is only used about 12 or 13 minutes in its entire lifetime, right? So can you imagine people who buy their own drill, like 99% of the time it's sitting in the garage, not being used at all when someone else could certainly be utilizing that. So it just doesn't make any sense for all of us to own our own drill and all of us to own our own ladder and power saw. Um, and um, it's not really about ownership, right? It's access to the tools that we want to have access to tools when we need them. So tool libraries offer access for all residents to have access to quality tools for little or no cost. And so this is especially beneficial to folks who maybe don't have the money, can't afford to buy uh, the tool that they need for this one project and it's not worth it for them to go out and buy it, but they can still do the project. They can just borrow the tool. Um, it builds community by offering a, a social hub where neighbors can meet each other, find out who else is in their neighborhood, find out what projects people are working on. It beautifies the neighborhood. Um, as people have access to tools, they're more likely to fix up their houses. So houses become fixed up, um, house values go up in the neighborhood. Um, and it also creates, uh, it promotes resilience and job skills for folks. Um, once they have access to tools, People, uh, you know, people are always talking about how um, we've lost a lot of t uh, skills from previous generations. No one knows how to fix anything anymore. We always have to call someone up to, to you know, fix a leak or something. And so um, by having access to tools, folks can practice these very, you know, useful practical skills that makes our community as a whole more resilient. And last but not least, uh, this is much more sustainable. Um, if 
everyone uh, borrows their ladders instead of all owning their own. This is fewer resources that are needed. It's, uh, the community has a smaller ecological footprint. And so this is a much greener and sustainable way to run our society. So tool libraries are a huge movement and it's growing all over the country. And as you know, as indicated by this map, which I got from localtools.org, um, these are just the libraries that have been registered on this website. So there's probably even more. Um, there's over 40 tool libraries across the U.S. right now um, and more growing around the world. And uh, hopefully your town is next and you can stick a little pin on that map. Boink, that's my tool library. All right. So I want to talk a bit about today's speakers. Now, uh, there is no one size fits all model for tool libraries. I invited four uh, different libraries to be represented today on this call, four different founders. Um, as you'll see, uh, tool libraries come in all sizes, really large, small, nonprofit, governmental. Um, it really depends on where you are and what works for the region, and there's no right answer. So um, today I want to uh, have a chance for you guys to hear from four different founders from libraries across the country. Uh, first, we have Michael Froelich. He is the co-founder of the West Philly Tool Library, and he will be uh, on the call. He doesn't have a camera, unfortunately, so you can't see his awesome face, but you will get to hear his awesome voice. Okay, second of all, uh, next on the list, we have Jason Hatch of North Portland Tool Library, and I'm going to try to see if I can get him up here on the screen so you guys can see him. Wave, Jason. There he is. Okay, that's Jason Hatch. He's from, um, uh, he's founded the North Portland Tool Library. Okay, I'm taking you away now, Jason. Okay, and with me, um, we have uh, in the same room, um, Ty Yurgalevic sitting here. There we go, say hi. Hi there, folks. He's the founder of the Temescal Tool Library in Oakland, California. And to his left, this is Pete McGilligot from the Berkeley Tool Library. Say hi, Pete. Oh. <laughs> Great. So all four of them are going to have a chance to, uh, to speak. And um, we are going to just real quick see some snapshots of what these uh, four tool libraries are like today. So the following slides will indicate just sort of the, some statistics about each of these tool libraries so that you can uh, compare them. So first, the West Philly Tool Library. So there's a wonderful picture of, of Michael right there. So you won't get to see him today, but that's what he looks like. So when he's talking, you should just imagine this guy here on the ladder. Okay, so the West Philly Library is in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, started in 2008. It is a nonprofit, um, has an annual budget of about $20,000 a year. Um, there's about 560 tool checkouts per month. And uh, members pay a very small fee. It's on a sliding scale of $20 to $50 a year. Um, and they have three part-time staff and about 10 volunteers. So that is the West Philly Tool Library. So what about the others? North Portland Tool Library is in Portland. Uh, Oregon started in 2004 and um, these are the four wonderful folks who started up the library um, and we have Jason Hatch with us today. It is also in the annual budget of about $14,000 um, and they have a, uh, over a thousand checkouts per month. Membership is free um, and they have one part-time uh, employee as well as a volunteer board of directors. Next, the Temescal Tool Library in Oakland, California, started in 2000, and um, it is a governmental organization, is part of the public library in the city of Oakland. Um, the annual budget is considerably larger than the nonprofits because it is part of the public library. It's about $250,000 a year, uh, 4,000 checkouts a month. Uh, membership is free as long as you have a library card. You have one full-time staff, four part-time staff, and many many volunteers. Okay, and Berkeley. Berkeley is one of the first tool libraries that started in the United States, started way back in 1979. Um, the picture you're seeing here, the color picture is of the current staff. Um, and um, since uh, I couldn't find a picture of, of Pete, I did find an old picture of him from a newspaper clipping. Not to say that you're old, 
but this is a, a old newspaper <laughs> clipping of Pete, so you can see him there helping a customer. Uh, so the Berkeley Tool Lending Library is also a governmental organization, part of the public library, has an annual budget of about $280,000, 4,300 checkouts per month. Membership is also free, and they have three part-time employees that you see there, um, and one intermittent employee that's, that helps out as needed. Okay, so um, without further ado, let's hear from these guys. So what we're going to do is um, each, uh, each speaker will talk for about five minutes about how their library got started, what sort of logistical challenges and uh, successes they experienced. Um, after they are done talking, we are going to talk about some more resources that are available for folks who want to start a tool library. And then we're going to close with questions. So here's an important note about questions. If you have a question that you would like to ask the speakers at the end of this webinar, to the right where it says chat, there's another tab that says questions. So if you type into the questions field, um, this is uh, going to be private. No one else can see it, but it's going to get sent right to me. Um, and then we're going to just compile questions throughout the webinar. And at the end, during q and I'm going to go into the questions tab and just go down the line and cover as many questions as possible. So um, during the webinar, if you have a question, go ahead and type it straight into the questions field, and then we're going to come back to it later. Okay, so, um, but, you, you know, if you have, so if this is if you have a question you want to ask during the session, you can put it into questions field, you can put it in the chat field. All right, cool. All right, so um, right now I'm going to uh, hand it off to Michael from West Philly. I'm going to try to hear, put him up so that you can hear him. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's see if I can get him to say something here. All right, Mike. When? Yes. When? Yes. When can you hear me? Very yes. good. Well, thanks uh, so much uh, to, to Wen uh, and for the Center for a New American Dream for putting this webinar together. Um, apologies that my internet connection um, is not so solid, so I uh, may fade out or even maybe drop. And I told Wen that if there's any uh, technical issues that become sort of insurmountable, that she should just go ahead and, and move on to Jason. So I'm one of the co-founders of the West Philly Tool Library. Uh, the West Philly Tool Library is located in West Philadelphia, and you see the, the um, information on the slide there. This picture not only is taken of, of a younger uh, Michael Froelich, but it's also in our old space. And in a moment, you'll see a picture of our new space. Um, I used to live out in uh, the Bay Area and was a patron of the Berkeley Tool Library and the Temescal Tool Library and even the San Francisco Tool Library back when it was open. And so when I moved back to West Philly, I thought there's no reason why we should not be able to have a tool library uh, here in West Philadelphia. So um, we started, uh, gathered up a group of friends, and we flyered at the farmer's market. And then we uh, got uh, a bunch of people who were interested in uh, forming a tool library together. Um, uh, one of the questions which a lot of people always ask me, um, and when, if you can move to the next slide, please, is um, how do you start the fundraising? Um, and how do you start gathering enough money uh, for, to, to start buying the, the tools? Um, for us, we hit upon what, what I thought was what we thought about was a kind of a novel uh, situation. What we did is asked a bunch of people to become founding members. So for $200 uh, uh, investment, they would become lifetime members of the tool library. And we told them that we were contemplating having a you know a 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 dollar annual membership fee. And if for two hundred dollars they would be a lifetime member um, uh, and uh, probably about 20 or 30 people um, signed up for this. And so instantly, well not so instantly, though, we had um, a, a core amount of money. We were also able to get a local landlord to donate a free storefront, which is a fantastic opportunity. Um, which allowed us to um, open up uh, our shop and actually have a, a location. Um, we explored a number of different uh, legal arrangements. Um, and the one that made the most sense for us was to become a fiscally sponsored project of another organization. In this case, we approached the uh, Urban Affairs Coalition here in Philadelphia, which agreed to um, uh, essentially accept donations for us, uh, handle our finances, provide a board of directors, and 
probably most ins uh, importantly to us, um, uh, handle all of our uh, legal liability and insurance. Um, uh, we started, uh, the next step was to meet with community organizations to get them on board. Um, and we met with churches and community development corporations, um, community associations, the city council people, the state representative, essentially everybody who we thought could either be supportive of us or if they disliked the idea, could block us down the road. Um, many folks and may have experienced an urban uh, uh, politics, uh, may uh, be nodding your head a little bit because you may understand some of the, the difficulties that people may face when starting a new organization. Um, and then, when, can you go to the next slide? Um, and then uh, we opened our doors. And originally, we, we used uh, volunteers um, to keep it open every Saturday morning uh, from 9 o'clock until 12 o'clock. Uh, as we started getting more popular and more tools, um, we expanded our, our hours to Tuesday and Thursday nights. And then as we got more and more popular, we expanded to our current time, which is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday from 5.30 to 8.30 p.m. And Saturday is from 9 in the morning until 3. And it really took us about three or four years to, to grow to that level to have those types of open hours. Um, we pay our tool librarians. Um, to keep it open, um, uh, uh, we, uh, we, uh, so, so somebody is, is always being paid to, 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 to keep it open, and everybody else is volunteers. So we have a volunteer tool coordinator, a volunteer, uh, volunteer coordinator, a volunteer accountant, a volunteer um, uh, tool donation coordinator. Um, you see our, our so, and, I, and I think starting small and growing really has, has worked. Systems issues, which you may encounter as you um, uh, as you may decide to start your own tool library, is it's absolutely critical to have a good database system. Um, we started out with, um, with one that was not so hot um, and eventually uh, uh, teamed up with folks um, from the Southeast Portland Tool Library who had um, a, a, a piece of, of web-based software called Tool Librarian, and you can find more information from them at tooллibrarian.com. And it's really revolutionized um, how we do uh, our tool library. It helps us so, uh, to keep membership records so much easier and tool records so much easier and send out emails to people when they don't turn their tools in on time. Um, we uh, uh, have a, a, a late fee policy where it's $1 per tool per day that the tool is uh, late. That applies to screwdrivers and it applies to power tools as well, ladders, everything in between, just because it's administratively convenient uh, for us. And it turns out that um, late fees um, uh, generate quite a lot of money for us. Um, probably uh, membership and late fees combined uh, are about 60% of our budget and the rest we gain, um, uh, obtain through writing grants and, and getting um, sort of other community supporters. Um, one thing that we had to face and to deal with, and you may also um, be dealing with, is this issue about organizational members and group houses. Um, here in West Philadelphia, we have a number of group houses where there may be, you know, eight or more unrelated adults living in the same house. And um, they've always wanted to know, well, can we just have one house membership? We've been pretty um, uh, consistent that each individual member must join the tool library. And if people push back a little, we say, look, it's 20 bucks, minimum 20 bucks a year. Um, what's the big deal? And folks are generally understand that their membership do, um, uh, goes to purchase new tools and to keep the place open. Um, uh, one of the other systems issues that we've encountered that you should be on the lookout for is um, very often members love the idea and they want to volunteer. And we've had so many uh, great volunteers that have been working with the tool library, but it's absolutely critical to, to, um, uh, to seize on them as soon, as soon as they say they want to volunteer, to, to follow up with them that day or that next day to say, this is what we need help with. Can you come on this day and get you know, early commitments? Um, early on, we would not be so good at track, tracking them down. And then a couple weeks later, we'd say, oh, you know, we hear you want to volunteer. Can you come in next Tuesday night to help uh, sharpen our chisels? And they're like, well, you know, other things have come up. But if you reach them that day um, to say, can you come in next Thursday to sharpen chisels, we found that they were much more likely to do that. And then finally, um, we didn't really have a good plan for tool maintenance at first. Um, 
uh, we should have, uh, was a bit of an oversight. Um, but once we realized that um, we needed sort of more dedicated time um, for tool maintenance, um, we, we uh, hired a, we, we applied for a separate grant from a community foundation who gave us money to hire somebody just to do tool maintenance. And when can you go to the next slide, please? Um, and that's really made all the difference because it's allowed us to return tools back into circulation much, much faster. I want to say one last thing. Um, you know, when we were, uh, started the tool library, we definitely saw it as specifically for something um, to, to do community economic development. Um, West Philadelphia uh, and, and where the tool library specifically is located um, is, a, um, is, is a pretty poor neighborhood. About 40% of households live in poverty. Um, it's also a neighborhood which is with a very high percentage of home ownership. Um, so we've definitely seen the mission of the tool library, um, in addition to the things that Wen talked about at the top of the, the webinar, as to be one to, to uh, really push community economic development. That has not, however, been something which has, has come easily or come uh, automatically. And so we've really had to dedicate uh, energy and money and, and sort of staff time to, to doing things, such as targeted outreach. When we opened the tool library, the majority of the people that first started um, were young professionals um, and people that lived within two blocks. Um, in order to make sure that the tool library was available to everybody um, and that everybody knew about it, uh, we had to do a much uh, better job of going door to door, flyering the neighborhood about the availability of the tool library to um, do outreach to local ministers at churches and imams at the mosques in the area. Um, uh, we also have uh, teamed up with community organizations to do classes because it's one thing to know that a table saw or a 40 foot extension ladder is available to you. It's a complete another thing to give uh, people the knowledge and the, 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 so the confidence to, 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 to be able to borrow those things. Um, and then finally, we're a very um, committed to the idea of a sliding scale membership. Um, originally we were at, we just said $20 a year for everybody. Um, and uh, some in April of 2011, we switched to a sliding scale membership. Um, overnight, um, the average member joined at about, well, the average membership was $35 without doing anything more than just saying, here's a sliding scale membership. Um, and we had, you know, sort of guidelines um, of, of, you know, if your income is this, you know, we recommend this. Um, so probably about half of the members uh, continue to join at the $20 level. Um, but uh, en enough people sort of voluntarily uh, pay a higher rate um, that it helps us you know, while still making membership open to all. So that's all I got for the West Philly Tool Library. And, and I'm um, really excited about listening to, to the other folks, uh, especially um, Jason at the North Portland Tool Library, who I'm not sure, Jason, if you remember this, but um, when we were opening our doors, uh, you, I spoke with you on the phone and you sent me your uh, waiver form, which we have now continued to use now. Excellent. Great. So uh, thanks a lot, Michael. That was really great. We're going to move on now to uh, Jason uh, Hatch from North Portland. Let me just start you up here, Jason. And showing your sound. All right, Hello. Jason, you are on. Okay, great. Hey, thanks everyone for uh, joining here. It's, it's great to actually be with these other folks that have uh, Worked on tool libraries. Um, uh, sort of the start of this is uh, inspired, as Michael described. Um, I lived in Berkeley for a number of years in in the South Berkeley neighborhood where the tool library is, and uh, walked through that by that branch library and saw a bunch of people um, lined up outside this building and walked in and saw that there were all these tools um, ready to borrow. So I want to thank Pete because he's really a pioneer in these formal uh, tool library groups. When I moved to Portland in 2001, I really, I wanted to, I, I borrowed the idea and wanted to figure out how can, uh, how can I bring that north. And I ended up moving into one of the neighborhoods in North Portland and uh, walked into a community neighborhood association building and was talking to the director of that and uh, sort of described the, the general idea. And this was in an old forest, or excuse me, an old uh, fire station building. And he essentially took me downstairs and said, how about here in the basement there? So right off the bat, was able to secure a location. Um, I ended up talking to some friends that I had met, uh, one of whom is Laura Dalton. You can see her in the, the uh, lower right-hand corner of that photograph. And she was a, a craftsperson, a carpenter, and also sort of taught 
uh, tool safety and other other uh, work with tools specifically. I didn't have those skills, so I ended up recruiting a group of folks that um, sort of we complemented each other and how we could move forward. So that was recruiting a team of, of folks, uh, building support. The NAs are the neighborhood associations. Portland has a strong neighborhood association um, network. And I went to talk to the leaders in each of those groups and described what the idea was, um, drawing upon what my experience was at, in Berkeley, um, and sought an advocate. When I describe advocate, we had somebody uh, within the North Portland Neighborhood Services uh, city employee who was um, supportive and helped us uh, utilize that building there. Um, we essentially have rent for free, utilities largely for free, so there is some uh, quasi-subsidy going on there, which is expressed in our budget. We, it's $14,000 a year. Uh, I took a trip down south with Laura and Matt Moritz, another founder, to work with uh, Adam Bronner at Berkeley Tool Library for a day and also with Ty, who you'll talk to later, uh, about how they set up their tool libraries and got a, a little bit better sense of sort of the behind-the-desk work. Um, one of our uh, discussions was what format do we take? There's governmental tool libraries, there's nonprofit versions, there's sort of an informal network of tool borrowing, and really what was available to us was a nonprofit, so a, let's uh, call it 501c3, and we sought a fiscal sponsor, someone that had that tax status, so we could go out and uh, seek grants. Um, there was also sort of a discussion about do you have this staff by volunteers or do you hire somebody? And we thought it important at the time that you have some consistency of someone that can keep track of not only the members but also the tools themselves. So we ended up hiring someone part-time and we still have someone working there part-time. What I mentioned earlier, there's a free location. People know where it is. It's sort of a notable building. It's easy to get to. Um, we look to tool libraries uh, in Berkeley and Oakland, uh, Missoula, and others that were sort of initiated under a community development block grant program through uh, the Housing and Urban Development Department. And our grant was for about $12,000. So that was our startup money. Um, we also have received ongoing funds. There's a, uh, a, a a raceway, an auto raceway that's nearby, and that, that group has to pay mitigation funds into a community grant program. There's also a regional government which has mitigation funds from a trash uh, landfill that was closed. So both of those are sort of recurring funding. And then we also sought out private foundation funding and received in our second year a $12,000 grant from a local uh, foundation. Next slide, please, Win. When can I go to the next slide? Thanks. Um, so sort of some of the logistics, this is the building itself. This is the uh, fire station. It was built in 1917. We used the basement that uh, horses used to come out of those two green doors there. One of the important parts of actually uh, setting this up for us was uh, being able to track the tools. They leave the building. Do they come back? You know they're yours. And tracking members. And we decided to set up a four-digit tracking system. We'd engrave the tools or paint the tools depending upon their size. And then members would also have a four-digit number. Um, so we would code those. I came up with uh, what seemed like a good idea at the time and was soon realized was not, <laughs> which was each member had their own uh, eight and a half by 11 cardstock uh, piece of paper that represented them and then um, then each tool had that. So when you would check them out, you'd have to fill out two forms, numbers on both the member form and also the tool form. And uh, that might have been good in 1950, but uh, apparently there's software programs. And we had a volunteer that used Access to develop a program to help us track. And that's been really helpful um, for us. They're recently going to move to a barcode system as well. Um, we've experimented with two different forms, which is uh, like they do at Berkeley and I think also at Oakland, which is you go up to the front of the line and say, I'd like these set of tools. We did that initially and now uh, the tool library has moved to a, all the tools are available on a variety of shelves. People will just come and bring them to the front of the line and read the numbers. 
to you. A liability waivers, um, that is something that we borrowed from Berkeley, which I think uh, Oakland borrowed that and others have. It essentially says that someone uh, knows how to use the tools and, and takes responsibilities for the use, safe use of those tools. Um, so we would not be held liable. liable. We sought uh, general liability coverage in the event that there is an accident and it was a million dollar policy. Um, I spent a lot of time looking and ended up finding a policy for about $500. I don't know if that's available anymore and we're now under an umbrella policy that the city has. Uh, again, sort of the debate between volunteers and staff and we decided that uh, staffing would provide some consistency. Can I have the next slide, Quinn? Thank you. Um, so on outreach, we uh, went to meet with uh, the neighborhood associations I described. We, uh, there are several community newspapers, neighborhood papers that we reached out in, articles. We uh, ended up having some, the local NPR station. Um, there was a morning program in which um, they do a break and there was this news anchor or uh, newswoman that was there to try out this, the circular saw, saw us flying, it's a good image. Um, we did, uh, I ended up doing flyering the immediate neighborhood uh, houses and then uh, getting a school, a leaflet that um, I brought to the schools to distribute to kids so they could potentially bring them home to their parents. Uh, Michael described tool classes. We also started tool classes. We wanted to um, introduce people to the safe use of tools and sort of increase their capacity to do good work in the community, building community, improving their neighborhoods, improving their own homes, uh, rentals if they uh, have them, uh, if, or if they're renters. Membership, we really debated about whether we wanted to ask people to pay a fee and decided that we really focus on um, going out and seeking funding and maintaining that the use of the tools were free so that, that wouldn't provide any barriers to anybody using them. Um, the initial grant itself, the Community Development Block Grant, has some standards that it wants you to meet in terms of income uh, and ethnicity we, uh, and other sort of categories. Uh, and it's, we uh, seem to have met those largely. I think our membership is probably at least 50% or more women as well. Um, so it's a variety of folks that are using the tool library now. There's upwards of 4,000 members, but we've continued to have it uh, be free. Some unexpected challenges, the location, uh, it's central, it's in a basement, um, and there's a set of stairs you have to walk down. So some of the larger tools um, is, are more difficult to navigate up those stairs, but the price is right. So uh, I think that kind of uh, makes it all all right. The tracking method, as I, I described, and other folks will be able to share what they're doing, but it's very important that you're able to track those tools. When we first, the first day we had 21 people sign up and you know, some 20 tools left the building. It was sort of this waiting game uh, for the next week if they'd actually return, and they did. And they have subsequently. People um, seem to get the idea that they're sharing. It's uh, like a, a book library. Uh, board development, there's sort of the founding board and then successor boards and trying to engage people. It's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it requires a lot of time to really be involved at the level that the volunteer board has, but they've done great a uh, great job and we've sort of replaced everybody. That's staffing, there's, you know, the challenge with staffing is that there's staffing turnover and we've probably had uh, six tool librarians um, in the time since we founded, but at least two of them have been there for three years. So it's been great. They have a great rapport with folks, which is helpful. They're able to talk through projects. Sustaining the overall project, uh, as I mentioned, there are some of those mitigate, mitigation grants. We've established several events that we do each year. There's a local um, beer uh, brewer chain in Portland called McMinimins, and they uh, actually donate 50% of the proceeds. We have a night, have some musicians that are there and do a raffle. So they raise money there. We've done direct mail to the members since we're not asking for, um, for a membership fee. And then there are fines and fees, uh, as Michael described. If uh, a tool's late or a tool come back, comes back in the condition you know, dirty, then there's an assessment there. And that's probably about 50 to 100 bucks a month.
So that's uh, that's what I have. Thanks for all, and I look forward to hearing from Pete and Ty. Thanks, Wen. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Jason. I will take you off the stage there. Um, next, we're going to hear from Oakland, which we are sitting in right now. We are sitting in the Oakland Temescal Tool Library in a lovely basement of the uh, of the Temescal branch of the Tool Library. Of so, the library. Of the of the library. The, the library itself. Of, yes, the actual the book library is upstairs. <clears throat> so I'm going to hand it over to uh, Ty. And um, we'll go from there. All right, here you go. Well, it looks like I'm on. Yes, you are. <clears throat> I wanted to thank Wen for uh, inviting me, uh, and especially Pete, because uh, Pete was a big influence in, in my life. Uh, let me start at the beginning here and tell you, uh, uh, I came to uh, uh, the tool library late in life. I I was working for a a large railroad uh, that uh, moved out of state and uh, didn't want to leave. And so I, uh, uh, I was desperate to find uh, another job. Little did I know that uh, I was going to become, nine months after looking for work, uh, I was going to become uh, a tool lending specialist, a job that I think I've enjoyed more than anything I've ever had. So uh, I'm happy to say that uh, uh, once I got the job, um, uh, I really, <clears throat> really dived into it because I, uh, even though I uh, have done a lot of work with tools uh, on my own house, done projects here and there, uh, I've never uh, been associated with a tool library before. So my first uh, uh, order of the day was to go right to Berkeley and uh, pick Pete's brain and see just exactly what it is uh, I've gotten myself into here. Uh, and uh, Pete was really helpful. Um, uh, I spent, as I said, several days there. And, uh, and it took me about six months before we actually opened our doors. I had to take uh, three bare rooms, uh, get furnishings, build a circulation counter, get all of our equipment, and then figure out a way to buy tools. Uh, we started, um, well, I was hired, for instance, in, in uh, July of uh, 1999, uh, and uh, uh, the funding came from a community development block grant also. So um, uh, it took me six months to get this place together and to open our doors January 8th of 2000. Uh, we really did have a very modest beginning. Um, our first month, we checked out 51 tools. Uh, as you probably can see from the slideshow, we're now well over 4,500 tools a month. Um, we also started by being open three days a week. Uh, we're now open four, and I've been pushing for years to be open a fifth day. That hasn't come yet. Um, so uh, I would say the, the biggest issues to a library uh, for us um, was, was helped out by being part of the Oakland Public Library system. We did have a software program that was available uh, and extremely useful for us. It wasn't tailored um, uh, to tools, and we had to, uh, we had to go um, around uh, back and forth in, in a lot of different ways to try and get what we wanted, but it still, I think, was a good system to keep track of our tools, um, uh, to inform people uh, when tools were late, and, uh, uh, and also to uh, record uh, uh, our problems with tools that needed repairs. Um, so apart from the tracking system, uh, the biggest problem uh, that we we uh, developed, which we learned right away, was the tools uh, that we started with were all nice, new, and shiny, but it didn't take long before uh, we ran across our first broken tool, and we had to figure out a way to get those fixed. Uh, well, uh, I wasn't um, uh, I wasn't big on tool repair myself, so oftentimes, uh, with the simple things, I, I managed okay. 
but we ended up uh, having to send our tools out uh, to particular places uh, that did tool repair, and, and that worked out uh, reasonably well. But I soon um, um, understood that we really needed to get someone on staff uh, that were more familiar with tools and, and were able to, uh, to fix tools. So um, uh, we, it, it took us several years before that happened. In fact, um, we sort of <coughs> were flying by the seat of our pants trying to keep things fixed. We, we still have a lot of tools that are in storage that need to be worked on. But we finally, two years ago, were able to hire somebody who actually is a, a fantastic tool repair person. Um, he's trying to catch up with the stuff that, uh, that we need uh, fixing. And, uh, and he's, uh, he's got limited hours here. So uh, we're, we're stuck with that. But I'm hoping to be able to expand his hours. And, uh, and in fact, if he were able to become full time, uh, he would simply be our, our, our full time tool repair specialist. Um, let me see. Uh, I'm losing track of where I am here, but uh, uh, one of the drawbacks with, uh, with starting with a community development block grant was we were limited um, in our patronage to people who lived in District 1. And Oakland has seven districts. Um, and that was only a small part of the city. So it was very difficult our first year trying to um, have people look at a map uh, with their utility bills uh, and having to turn them away when they lived just across the street from, uh, uh, from the border with another district. Well, I found that very difficult. People found it difficult. And, uh, and I brought that issue before city council. Um, uh, we also had problems our second year in that we weren't going to be um, and, uh, uh, and we were very desperate uh, about our funding and and basically at a at a council meeting uh, the city manager uh, asked me why we wanted to limit our patronage to uh, people in in district one and I told them that wasn't my intent at all that uh, I was hoping he can can help me out and find a way to uh, to get funding well he ended up um, uh, pretty much saying uh, I think the whole city needs to be uh, serviced by your facility, and we're going to <clears throat> we're going to get uh, uh, um, funding from from the general fund, which is really based on property taxes. So, uh, so that's what we did in our third year, and ever since then, uh, our our program just <coughs> flourished and and uh, until we're um, until so we've, we've arrived where we are today, we've set uh, three record-breaking uh, uh, checkouts in the last three months. And it seems like uh, we're going to continue to expand. And now what we need is uh, a new facility. And we have a group of friends, friends of the tool library, who are hoping to work with our administration and trying to find a new location for us. I think that may be it. Did you want to talk about anything else on your slides here? Oh yeah, let me <laughs> let me mention what we we did uh, arrive at um, at a slightly novel way of uh, determining what our fees would be for late fees or fines. Um, we based our fines on the uh, the value of the tool. So screwdrivers, in our case, uh, are a dollar, which is our lowest fine. But our demolition hammers and our large drain snakes are $20 per day. Uh, and they tend to be our more expensive tools. So our fines really range from uh, one, two, five, ten, and twenty dollars per day. And um, even though these uh, these fines we collect are fairly substantial, we get about um, about twelve thousand dollars a year in fines. Uh, that that money goes back into the general fund. So uh, a lot of people are concerned that we get that money for, for purchasing more tools. In the end, we do, since we're funded by the general fund. But uh, uh, we don't have that money set aside specifically for tools. Um, 
That's, yeah, that may be it. I, I think my time is up. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I want to make sure to leave time for questions. So we're going to move over <laughs> to uh, Pete, which almost everyone has mentioned at this point. This is Pete McGilligan, the founder of the Berkeley Tool Library. I'm going to move the slides ahead so that he can do his thing. All right, Pete, you're on. Okay, I want to thank Wen for inviting me to be in this. Uh, I'm sorry I don't have a bunch of fancy pictures. Uh, I guess I should have done that, but I didn't. Uh, but anyway, I want to say that uh, <clears throat> it's been a long time. Uh, we started back in the day before computers were so uh, omnipresent, so just about everything we did was kind of a pr uh, old school, uh, primitive way. But uh, we started out, our funding came from a CDBG grant, uh, like some of the others. Uh, we, get, we had an original grant of uh, $30,000. Uh, CDBG, I guess you know what that is. It's a, it's a program that was enacted in the 70s to, to alleviate uh, urban blight. And, and so the library got a, got a grant, and uh, we were able to open up in uh, January of 79 a little picture of a trailer. That's what we ended up being in. It was a construction office unit that we rented. Um, the location was uh, the South Branch Library, which happened to be located in, in one of the target areas for the CDBG grants, uh, a low-income neighborhood with substantial uh, housing uh, deterioration. Most of the tools we got <clears throat> originally were from the Sears Industrial Catalog. Um, actually, before I was hired, um, a lot of the tools were already had been purchased. Uh, I don't know if you know uh, much about the uh, history of California uh, politics, but uh, in uh, 1978, uh, an, an anti-tax initiative was passed, which slashed uh, uh, property taxes uh, throughout the state, and the library was faced with having to uh, close all its branches. So even though we'd been planning to have the tool lending library, uh, it was put on ice for about six months because uh, the library was faced with having to close its branches. Uh, once the uh, somehow they came up with a, a solution, and uh, we were able to get started uh, the following. Uh, the following year. The, um, the way we track our, our tools uh, would be uh, with a four-digit number, which is uh, engraved or painted on the tools. And the uh, borrowers, of course, are, are, have to be Berkeley Public Library users and have a library card, so we can track them that way. Uh, originally, uh, we had to do everything on paper. Um, for the first 10 years uh, of the tool library, we <clears throat> we kept a binder, a uh, three-ring binder with uh, with uh, legal size or a letter-sized paper in it. Every time someone borrowed a tool, uh, we filled out a paper uh, with carbon and uh, listing the tools, the digit four-digit number of the tools, and uh, and the name and address and phone number of the uh, patron and uh, and had them sign it at the bottom, and uh, then gave them the carbon copy and kept uh, our copy in a in the binder. And we had dividers uh, dividing them by uh, by date, so that uh, once some, when something came due, we would know. <clears throat> and then we, if they were late, we'd start making phone calls to try to get them back. Um, originally, uh, we were. Because we had the CDBG grant, uh, we were supposed to be <clears throat> uh, showing that at least uh, a, a simple majority of our patrons were of low income uh, or of uh, some minority group. Uh, for the CDBG, we had to keep uh, a lot of demographic information according to uh, uh, sex, um, um, <clears throat> Uh, ethnicity, race, uh, and uh, income level for, for our people. So uh, it soon became people 
we're, use, we're using the, uh, <clears throat> the tool library then could be justified uh, on the basis of their income and, and that sort of thing. So we instituted a, 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 a policy of charging a fee to people who lived outside the low income neighborhoods. So, uh, for, like I said, for the first 10 years, we did that. Uh, at, at the end of the 10 years, the library was prevailed upon to uh, get rid of the trailer, which by that time had been broken into so many times and uh, <clears throat> was deteriorating so that uh, the library was urged to take over funding. Uh, so we were weaned off of CDBG. Let's see, uh, unexpected challenges. Uh, mostly due to our limitations. We just didn't have <clears throat> enough tools to, uh, to satisfy people. So there were a lot of uh, unsatisfied people who couldn't get certain things they wanted, certain kinds of tools we couldn't have uh, for various reasons. And we felt, I felt it necessary to keep it limited so that what we did we could do well. Uh, <clears throat> another uh, another uh, unexpected uh, challenge. Let me see. I've got them listed here. So. <laughs> uh, they're, they're up on the was, screen too. Yeah, oh, I see. Right. The the patron access problem because we we had to restrict it to Berkeley residents only. Well, if you know Berkeley and Oakland, there's you, you just go across the street and you're in you're you go you're in Oakland. But we had to continually turn away people from neighboring communities like uh, Oakland, Albany, and Kensington, which are uh, directly neighboring Berkeley, and that was a problem because it was unpopular, <clears throat> and people tried every kind of scam they could to. Uh, to get us to fool us into thinking they lived in Berkeley, they had uh, rentable mailboxes and uh, <clears throat> yeah, and using uh, friends' addresses and all sorts of things to uh, to try to get around the residency requirement. And uh, let's see, stability. Uh, the way to keep it going, I think, is just to maintain the quality of the tools, uh, just to make sure that people get good service. Uh, if you Borrow something that's supposed to be sharp. You want to make sure it's sharp and that it works. You don't want to borrow a tool that doesn't work. And so basically, it just work. Keep things keep things sharp and in good working condition. And I guess that's the best best way to keep it going. Okay. Well, we have a few minutes left for um, questions, and I'm going to bring everyone back up on the screen, including uh, Jason and Michael. Um, and I'm looking at the questions that are in the question tab. And one question that a lot of people seem to be asking is, what happens if you lose a tool? Um, and if anyone, uh, and what you do if, if someone just loses a tool. So I'm wondering if, if any of you guys can sort of uh, tell us what your library's policy is. Well, in Berkeley, what happens is, <clears throat> We uh, levy a charge uh, against the person for the uh, for the cost of replacement. Um, in some cases, there uh, you know there are we, sometimes we will negotiate with someone to have them replace the tool uh, directly rather than pay uh, a cash fee for it. But uh, generally speaking, uh, we charge them if they lose it, even if it's stolen from them. Well, I can say uh, pretty much that's our experience. And w what I find is that most people who are responsible, uh, certainly if they if they break a tool, uh, they're oftentimes ready to, to pay for its replacement. The easiest thing for us is to simply have the person uh, buy the tool that broke. We take the tool, check it in, we just give it that same number. And it makes it easy uh, for us, rather than giving us a check for the tool, uh, and, which means we have to go out and buy it. <clears throat> but generally, uh, the issue is um, some, some tools uh, that are older uh, may be dying a, a, a slow death and uh, from fatigue or, or other things, and, and we do negotiate with patrons. We're not going to charge them uh, a full price for a, a Pigmatic uh, that's 12 years old uh, that doesn't have much life left into it. So uh, 
So that's negotiable. But, but generally, we found that uh, most people are pretty cooperative with, uh, at least with our explanations for, uh, for their charges. I think that Jason, uh, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, the experience that we've had is that uh, if people take the tools out, that they're taking responsibility for them, and we've had uh, patrons who's who actually had some tools stolen from their car. Another one was um, lost in a house fire, and both those folks kind of stepped right up and said, "Remind me what it was, and I'll go out and buy it." Um, so I think that's been pretty refreshing that people understand that. Uh, if once it's gone, that someone else doesn't have access to it, so they're gonna, they're going to make good on that. Great. And um, as uh, before we go on to the next question, I want to make sure to cover that uh, some resources that are available for folks who want to learn more about these uh, about how to start a tool library. First, there's a website called localtools.org, which actually offers a computerized system that you can use to uh, track things in your tool library. So please check out localtools.org. There's a screenshot of it on the screen. Um, next website is called sharestarter.org. And um, this is a really awesome site. There's a whole starter kit on this website. It gives you templates for budgets, templates for waiver forms, um, templates for just about anything. Um, so everything you need to get started is at sharestarter.org. Um, and also, there is a National Tool Library Google group, which uh, Michael Froelich started a couple years ago. If you go to the website on the screen, um, and all of this will be emailed to you, so if you're frantically writing it down and can't find a pencil, that's okay. Um, if you join this Google group, you'll be connected with folks all over the country who are interested in starting tool libraries or are working at tool libraries, and you can get advice and get your questions answered that way. So um, please check out the Google group. And of course, the Center for a New American Dream has a community action kit. Um, we have this free guide. It's called the Guide to Sharing. Um, and in there, we have um, a step-by-step -step guide on how to start a tool library, which you see on the screen. But we also have uh, step-by-steps for other sharing uh, projects, such as clothing swaps, such as how to start a solar co-op, um, and how to uh, start a time bank. So New Dreams Guide to Sharing, totally free, lots of resources. So uh, I just wanted to make sure that people got those resources. So um, uh, if folks need to get off right now at this very moment, go for it. But um, I want to make sure to try to get in at least a couple more questions if folks can hang on. Um, one big question that people have been asking in the question field is uh, liability and whether folks are injured. injured um, using power tools. So um, I'm wondering if any of you guys here can can sort of speak to your experience with people getting injured and, and any liabilities issues that you you've had. <clears throat> well, in Berkeley, uh, we, it was pretty quickly determined that we couldn't afford uh, any kind of insurance. Uh, they were talking about maybe Lloyd's of London or something like that. But, <clears throat> but uh, so our, our only liability protection really is uh, a waiver and indemnification form, which uh, many people who claim to know say would not hold up in court if there were um, any substantial evidence of negligence on our part. But in fact, uh, people have been uh, very good about it, and we've never been threatened with a lawsuit or anything like that. There have been some uh, some injuries, some fairly substantial. Uh, even though I wasn't there at the time, I, I retired uh, in uh, 2001, so I wasn't there, but somebody did uh, cut off some fingers. Uh, <clears throat> and luckily, they were able to retrieve them and have them reattached, but uh, they, they definitely did it with one of our saws. <clears throat> uh, various other Less traumatic injuries have happened that I've heard about, but nobody wanted to hold us responsible for them. So I guess you could say we're lucky, but I, we're also try to try to give as much safety instruction as, as we can, try to determine whether a person seems to know what they're doing or has uh, you know has about has their wits about them uh, when they uh, tell you what they are going to use the, the tool for. So. Some things just by by getting a read on the people who are buying. 
and that's about it. Well, I'll tell you, Pete, that's interesting because uh, the only incident that we've had that was reported to me was uh, a man whose father, using one of our table saws, actually cut several of his fingers. And of course, when uh, this gentleman came in to talk to me about it, uh, my first question was, uh, was there any problem with the saw? Uh, and he said, oh, no, absolutely not. He said, I just want, I wanted you to know that my father is getting too old. And uh, he uh, was not very um, uh, mindful when he was using the saw. And uh, the end result was he had, he was hospitalized. Uh, but the, uh, the concern that the, uh, the patron had was that I make sure uh, never to allow his father to check out a tool, even though he was registered. And, uh, and he was apolog very apologetic about it. So uh, I feel fortunate that uh, that's the only incident that we've had reported. Uh, but I guess it, it says something. I don't know if your injury uh, or the injury you talked about, Pete, was with a table saw. But uh, I, I think it was with a table saw, so, but yeah. uh, it could have been with a skill saw. Skill because saw I, sure. you know, I only heard about it secondhand. Yeah. And, uh, but I mean, that's, that is a big, uh, that's a tool that uh, uh, over, uh, over years and listening to people that, uh, uh, that has caused a lot of accidents. I, had a re I ran my hand across a table saw myself about five years ago, <laughs> and I've got a, a numb finger to, to prove it. <laughs> <laughs> Still got the finger, though. Okay, great. Um, Jason, did you want to say anything about that? Um, I would say that we use the same liability form that both uh, Ty and Pete had at their libraries. So I think that, I mean, you know, it may not provide the... Um, sort of bulletproof protection, but we also have a liability policy behind that. Um, we offer those that people have, uh, it's, it's no guarantee certainly, but give have the most uh, skills to be able to use those tools. And I think another part of it that's really important that I think everybody has mentioned is you really want to engage the borrower and have that, you know, ask what the project is, do you have experience with this tool? And so there's a lot that occurs during that conversation that's pretty important to, uh, as Pete says, sort of assess who's taking the tool. Great. Okay. Well, I want to respect everyone's time, and we've gotten, uh, we're about five minutes over. So um, I just want to wrap up by really thanking everyone for um, taking your time to be a part of this webinar. I want to thank our, our guests, uh, Michael Froelich and uh, Jason Hatch. Ty Yergilevic and Pete McGilligot for their valuable time. Also want to thank Adam Broner of the Berkeley Tool Library who also helped uh, gather a lot of stats for this. Really want to thank Post Carbon Institute, um, our partner organization for this webinar um, and for uh, them letting us uh, partner together and use uh, the Watch It Too with them to present this. And of course, uh, to thank all of you for, for participating. And um, uh, Michael, his uh, audio broke, but he, uh, he's been chatting his answers into the chat field. So hopefully you've been able to see that. Okay, so for, just for next steps, um, I just want to let you all know that you'll be receiving an email with um, a survey to ask you how this webinar went for you. Please fill it out to help us uh, improve our webinars. We plan to have webinars every two months from now on about a different community project. So I hope that you can join us and, um, and also help us improve this. So fill out the survey. Um, the recording for this uh, webinar will be online uh, by Monday. And um, all of you will get an email with the link to the recording so that um, you can um, watch it again because it was so exciting or share it with folks. Um, and uh, we've also added you to the New Dream mailing list so that you know about when future webinars are um, coming up. Um, if you don't like getting emails from us, just unsubscribe um, on the bottom of the email and you won't hear from us again. Um, and of course, a very important next step is for you to start your own tool library, to get thinking about it, um, and to start plans to, to uh, get it happening in your community. If you had any questions that uh, were not covered 
in this webinar, and I'm sorry we weren't able to cover them all. Uh, please feel free to send the emails to me. I will uh, make sure to get those questions answered. Also, uh, please join that Google group that I had mentioned earlier. Tons of expertise there and people who can um, answer your questions there. So um, on that note, I would like to thank everyone for their time. Go out there, start your tool libraries. It's an awesome community asset, um, and I hope everyone has a really great day.